menopause needs a rebrand. Women have been told that the hot flashes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, and insomnia are just part of the change and something that you need to grin and bear. But they're not. Advancements in medicine can keep the symptoms of menopause at bay and help you stay vital and healthy into your 80s, 90s, and beyond. This isn't your grandmother's menopause. And this is the Spinster Life Podcast, the podcast that puts the hot in hot flashes. Michelle Wispelway returns to the podcast to tell us why we shouldn't sit back and accept the discomforts of menopause with a smile, and how to find a healthcare professional that will help guide you through menopause. Michelle is the co-founder and president of Femgevity. She's a visionary leader in the femtech and digital healthcare industry with 18 years of experience in women's health initiatives. She founded Femgevity, a digital telemedicine platform providing women with custom concierge care for menopause and feminine longevity to empower women to take control of their well-being and achieve their fullest potential. Now, I am back with Michelle Wispelway. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you for having me again. It's an honor. Yes, and I am so honored for you to tell us about menopause. It's this thing that we don't talk about. And I think menopause gets a bad reputation. So let's let's break down menopause. Let's dispel the myth that it sucks, that there's nothing you can do about it, that you just have to suffer through the hot flashes and the mood swings. And let's tell women what they can do about it, what proactively they can do to make menopause better. Yeah. So menopause has been viewed as a negative experience and portrayed as just this physical and emotional symptoms as hot flashes, mood swings, weight gain, vaginal dryness, headaches, insomnia, it leads to Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's been it's been contributed to a, sen- a sense of anxiety and dread for women as they approach this age. And you also, it's like a loss of femininity, femininity and we talked about declining fertility. We did that, but it's not the end. There are so many treatment options and we're out of the woods with everyone just abiding by what WHI put out years ago and took and got millions of women off hormone therapy. And there, there's so many personalized treatment plans for women and using combined medical therapies to tailor specific needs with protocols. And there's things that you could do with pharmaceuticals, biologics, bioidentical hormones, natural products derived from plants and minerals and nutraceuticals and even like alternative medicine. There's acupuncture and and, um, chiropractic and traditional Chinese medicine that even you can even do Um, sauna. I'm a huge, huge fan of the sauna and wearables. Wearables are a huge thing with monitoring like CGMs and aura rings and and different types of medicine. We do a combination of precision medicine, hormone therapy, lifestyle, and integrative. So you really have to bundle it all together and get down and wrap your hands around the patient and really figure out what's best for them. And to know that do not let someone just say you have to deal with it and slap an estrogen patch on you or give you some Prozac or anxiety medication because you're feeling anxious and your brain's going crazy. Yeah. And this is really what you are trying to do at Femgevity is to really personalize menopause and to give women options and to make this yeah, not, to make this a not shitty time of life, to make this a, a, a wonderful transition into this new phase of your life. Yeah. We're creating solutions that empower women and to take control. And we're having women get their hormones balanced because once your hormones are balanced, then you really can get into this feminine longevity medicine. That's really always been tied around very male dominated. That's always been like the Andrew Huberman, the Peter Atiyahs, the Mark Hyman's. And actually Peter Atiyah talks, is started talking a lot of it, a lot more about like estrogen and, and hormone therapy, but it's always been very, like if you look at row health, it originated with like erectile dysfunction. But you need now, really, once you get your hormones balanced and your perimenopause under control, then you can really graduate yourself into figuring out on more of a granular level and what really health span versus lifespan mean and seeing those different options to live longer to prevent disease. Yeah. yeah I love health span. Yeah. I never even thought about it like that because there is this perception that you just, you get old and your body falls apart and that's just part of it but i think we've all seen or have a relative we all know somebody or have seen someone on tv who's like 100 and they still 
have a really full life. They exercise, they get out, they're really sharp. So like, I think we've seen that this is possible to have a long health span where you can really enjoy your life. Yeah. There is a, there's a study that the first person to live to 150 is actually alive today. And we really believe that you could feel 30 when you're 70. And it's really what it comes down to is focusing on yourself, those perimenopause years, and before you hit menopause, and to get that health span and longevity to get a little deeper with your epigenetics and understand like your nutrigenomics and thing and and all different types of like things like that from genomics because there's so many cool testing and tracking your sleep and that is what's going to circle down to your health span and being like those older people on TV that are Zumba and riding bikes <laughs> at uh, 90 cuz we all want to be that nobody wants to be in a nursing home in bed no. all day nobody wants that be, yeah you don't want to be 90 in a diaper you want to be yeah. 90 going for a walk I'm and you can on. you yeah. can um, if you focus on yourself. So let's talk first about menopause and how it's generally perceived now. What's the story that we've been told about how you're going to feel, how you're going to act, how it's going to impact your day-to-day life, and you know what the story around that traditionally has been? Yeah. So menopause has really been, it's the end of life. It's It's when you have to retire. It's when you don't work. It's when you're a grandma. It's when you really have to slow down. A a lot of people don't associate certain symptoms that they have with menopause and ignore them. And that's why they end up having a lot of health issues. But menopause has just been poorly, there's been such a misconception and it's really been around a combination of like cultural, social and, and medical factors that have just been just created negative experiences with just mental instability instability and outburst and rage. There's just those things that you feel when you like, especially when you're losing progesterone and testosterone and estrogen levels and your fertility is up and it's just been very taboo and no one talks about it because it's embarrassing. And menopause is also really viewed as the end of your sex life with your partner too, because they, you don't feel sexy anymore. And you don't feel good. And there's actually studies that recent studies in 2020 that have talked about like the rate of divorce is actually higher during those perimenopause to menopause ages, because that's when a lot of spouses are like just emotionally disconnected because doesn't know what's going on with the woman, the man doesn't understand, and there's just lack of education. So there's also there there's that too, that a lot of relationship issues that occur with it. And I, that probably stems from not just men not knowing about menopause and how it affects a woman. Because let's face it, most men don't understand most things about women's anatomy, periods, anything like that. But also just from women not understanding it fully, because Mm. there is this taboo, because we don't talk about it. It is just this thing that it's menopause. It's shameful almost that, oh, you're you're old now. So you don't, your body is changing and you're Mm. becoming not valuable because you are not going to be fertile anymore. So you just, it's like a secret shame that women take on and just deal with it by themselves. Yeah. You don't feel youthful anymore. And it's that fear of you you can't bear child anymore. And you're not the young fruit for your husband or your boyfriend. So really like, what are you? So you, you get kind of confused and there's been that misperception between our mothers and our grandmothers and generations going back of where your place is. And now it's completely different. The women are empowering now to be older. And one of my biggest words that I constantly use is just confidence (laughs) and empowerment. That's exactly it. It's easy to be like a small girl, you know your role there. And then you get Mm -hmm. the talk for puberty, you get prepared for it. There are like magazines and books and like you're you're in it together and you're talking to your friends like what's mm-hmm. happening during puberty, childbearing years, that's sort of like a, a thing that everybody talks about. But like, yeah, there's no preparation for what comes after. Whereas menopause, it sounds liberating. Like you don't need to worry about getting pregnant anymore. You don't need to worry like, oh, is my period just going to pop up out of nowhere that I have to deal with? 
there's you don't have to worry about the the period symptoms pms you're not really dealing with those constant fluctuations in hormones it sounds like liberating but we but we don't talk about it like that yeah i don't think it was ever taught to our female predecessors like that no so that's why in 2023 is the year that's really going to take charge of the shift to self on what the women now are going to be teaching our younger generations of the excitement that goes on past that. There's so much more. It's like when you take back your life and I think for, through your like thirties and forties, there's so much like giving and women almost feel guilty to take care of themselves before their like husband or their boyfriend or their parents or aunts and uncles and especially kids. And now's the time where you it's okay to be a little selfish and re refocus on yourself. And yeah. that's what we need to teach the younger generations. And our mothers were not giving that confidence to do that or the tools. And now we are. So I think that's why, you know, the birds and the bees were our fairy tale story where we're little girls and you're going to get your period and you're going to have children and a husband and the wedding and people have children now and don't even get married. They just coexist together yeah. and, and are partners. And that's totally fine too, you know, and it's not like that anymore. And, and there's a new tale. Yeah. No. And how much of a fairy tale is, hey, remember those periods? Or just like, hey, you know, all that angst and unsurety that you felt when you were younger? Yeah. That all goes away. <laughs> and you feel you feel like more in touch with yourself. You feel more at home with yourself. You know yourself better. You stand up for yourself more. All of these things that come with age and wisdom. Uh, yes. Wisdom. Like, yes. Yeah. Like how much of a fairy tale is that? That like, you become your own fairy godmother. You don't do things just so people like you. You right. you go with your gut and what feels right. And I think that's more powerful to teach my daughter. I have a young daughter than, oh, you're going to have your period and this is what happens. No, when you get older, you're going to rule the world and you <laughs> can be comfortable and confident and you don't have to like everybody, but you can still be diplomatic. But Yes. Screw the period talks. Let's talk about the aging and what really yes. the good stuff that happens. Yes. The whole of it. It's not just like, this is the day you become a woman. Like you are, just because you don't get your period anymore, you're still a woman, a human. You're still like this bigger idea. I think you become more of a woman as you age, because like you said, wisdom, that's yeah. what makes you become an adult and a woman. Yes. Is, is, a. Uh, is having all this and having all this to share. And yes, I am a hundred percent on board. I don't have any kids, but I'm a hundred percent on board with teaching young girls about all of it. Yes. So let's also talk about comfort. We have brought that up a couple of times. So menopause is just generally thought of as just an uncomfortable time because of not only those mental things around not knowing your place and this big shift in your life, but just the actual symptoms of it are uncomfortable. It is. It's very uncomfortable. If you go untreated or you don't do something, it is extremely uncomfortable. It, it's funny because if, if a man had pain during intercourse or starting sweating randomly constantly, it, even in, in at a workplace, there would be something done and they wouldn't be told that they have to live through it. I mean, Viagra, I read somewhere that Viagra was approved in about under a year when the FDA approved it. But for hormone therapy, it took years. That is, because, um, it's yeah, because so a man needed to get... It's yeah. insane. <laughs> it's insane. It's very uncomfortable, you know, not being able to sleep, heavy periods on and off. Some women during perimenopause stages before they hit menopause, they have their period 20 out of the 20, 30 days, depending which month it is. Imagine not knowing when it's going to go away or cramps and moodiness and, and headaches or dizziness and fatigue, or they have muscle pain and joint pain. And it's extremely uncomfortable. And that's why it's, it, we see some patients that, and we see you see their symptoms and I can't even believe that they've been living like this. We have one patient that has been taking NyQuil for 10 years, 10 years to sleep. We treated her, got her what she needed, 
And she's like the first time she slept, she's been sleeping consistently for like 10 years. That That takes like years off your life. Yeah. If you have had children too, like you've spent all of these years not really sleeping consistently. When you have babies and and really small children, you're getting up with them a lot. So this is what, just like 20, 30 years of not sleeping very well. And that's why there's such an increased risk if you look at the data and the statistics for women with Alzheimer's and dementia. It's so much higher in women than men. And it's because of those perimenopausal years that go untreated with insomnia. Oh, that it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that we're not talking about that. Like, this is something. No one talks about it. Yeah. This, like, sleep is, we're not talking about like that there is a, a cause for people not sleeping that is treatable. Correct. I think that's a huge thing to talk about too. That like I we discussed a little bit that like our mothers and grandmothers, it was just something that you had to like grit your teeth and get through. Is that the case now? Do you just have to accept that menopause is uncomfortable? No, you do not accept that. You you need to go to a doctor that is specialized in menopause that that knows hormone about hormones and not just someone that's going to give you a patch or just pellets, but can look at the whole picture and give you a personalized treatment plan on on really what's good for you. Doctors actually have not been historically trained in menopause. Menopause has really been an elective in medical school. And I do foresee that changing just with the hype of menopause and where this industry is going about it and the attention that it's getting and that there's finally like coming up in like research and development and innovation and this whole femtech industry, but doctors don't know what to do with it. You know, I've been in the medical field my entire life and, you know, I kind of been like going back to my roots and talking to old clients and they tell me like, I don't know what to do with it. I just give them some supplements or write them some gabapentin or just give them progesterone and they don't know what they're doing and the balances and all the different analytics of it. And they're not trained. And our healthcare system doesn't allow the doctors to actually to have the opportunity to treat these women because it's an ongoing process. It's not just like one treatment and that's you're done with it. It's you have to do monitoring every 30 days. It it could take someone three weeks to four months to really depending like where they are at and how they feel. And there's no CPT code for doctors to bill out for a menopause consultation. They're kind of like write their script or they say they have to live with it or, and then they have their OB patients waiting or their annuals and things like that. You know, you can't blame the medical community and and doctors for not knowing how to do it. It's not, it just hasn't been written and it just, our U.S. healthcare system is. Yeah. That's a whole other. I think there's definitely somebody to blame there. Um, Yeah. It is, it is striking to me that it's really not, insurance companies don't even recognize that menopause is a condition. They don't even pay for hormone therapy. It's all out of pocket. Which yeah. is insane if you're saying like mm-hmm. some kind of hormone therapy and working on this can prevent so many health issues down the line. Yeah. So estrogen, there's much more benefits than risks of taking estrogen and not taking estrogen. Not taking estrogen you can get diabetes, osteoporosis, prevents UTI, pain during sex, diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, because it's preventing you from your body deteriorating. You know, you lived your whole life with a certain amount of hormones. So of course, when they start depleting, you're going to feel terrible and you need some of those back and you need a doctor that's trained on how to dose them properly. Yeah. It's like just any medication, you don't usually just t- stop taking a medication suddenly. The mm-hmm. hormones are, are a little bit like that. If if they, you just don't suddenly don't have them, that is very disruptive yeah. to your whole system. It's, it's interesting if you ask any woman woman that is on some type of bioidenticals, they will tell you it has saved my life. It has saved my marriage. It just has. It's I can't live without it. I have sat with women that are like I could live without. E- The one thing I would never live without was my hormones. It saved me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what that kind of looks like in in a treatment plan. Yeah. So it it really depends, right? So I could talk on how we do it. We don't treat anybody without doing some type of laboratory testing to really have like analytical data. We're not just going to treat just only on symptoms, but we have AI digitalized lab analytics 
and we combine the two of them together. And that really what is giving like our patients this customized precision medicine where we're kind of bringing our concierge medicine down to this like consumer level so everybody can afford it. And it, and it depends, you know, some, some women need pharmaceuticals, some will be bioidenticals and nutraceuticals, which could be like vitamins, minerals, amino acids. Some women will recommend a wearable, like a CGM or an aura ring, you know, d- different types of things like that with like tracking y- your certain levels and, you know, even natural products like homeopathic and herbal remedies and some maybe even like uh, we, we've we've guided people towards some acupuncture and chiropractic stuff too. In addition, so it's it's not one size fits all. It's a journey, and those things need to be tweaked every thirty days until they're really like their levels are balanced. And you know, sometimes we'll go into a deeper dive for more of a like a longevity purpose because there's a lot of things with the gut microbiome that if that's messed up in a woman, it affects her estrogen levels. So you could be exercising and dieting and taking your bioidenticals and still not getting to your max capacity where you should be because your gut microbiome is just a mess. There's so many factors. This is like so insanely inter like <laughs> ed- interesting and educational. Yeah, I'm in, I'm enthralled by all of this. So it is it's possible. There are solutions out there and they're not crazy expensive and they're not out, they're not what? inaccessible. They're ex- these are accessible solutions if you can find the right practitioner. One thousand percent, very accessible, and they are at your fingertips. You just have to find the right person. Yeah, let's talk just a little bit too about the just the medical establishment as a whole and how it views mm-hmm. women. So it's interesting. Is the medical establishment's really always been male dominated? All of a lot of studies, even. If you go back to the study on aspirin with preventing strokes and and, and crushing up a baby aspirin, that study was actually done on men, not even women. Everything, it's just been very male dominated and women have been second class and it's been a custom in our society to women could suffer and men get the R&D and the research and the pharmaceutical companies and the hospitals that that back it. And most of it's really run by men and yeah. that that are leading. Even the WHI study, it was mostly men that ended up approving all that in the journals and, and the, the, the journalists and the writers. And that was very a male dominated study. Even if you go to something even so recent is everyone talks about like the cold plunge, but it, they... It's really the most of the studies have really been on the benefits for men. There's been a couple recent studies that talked about there's really no benefit for women to do a cold plunge. It's really for men. It's just, it's, that's the way it's been. And, but it's changing. It's the femtech world was coined in 2016. And that's what has really helped change, change the narrative for a gap in innovation in women's health. And, and and it's come a long way since even 2016. So, And I feel that like there is still room that it has to go just because there have been oh, so yes. many years where drugs haven't been tested on women and doctors have this perception of women's pain and men's pain. They perceive it differently and they deal mm-hmm. with it differently. I've heard so many stories of women in d- way different kinds of procedures. I have had friends who've had IUDs put in and then had either discomfort during the insertion or discomfort after and doctors just being like, well, I don't, you know, it'll probably resolve itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Women with fibroids, women with all of these conditions that they're just told it's normal or you're just going to have to get through it or they're just straight up not believed. Yes, that is absolutely true. It's interesting. So I had a hysterectomy last May unexpectedly and I I still my ovaries, but the things that w- should coincide with that is that there should be some type of follow up from the doctor on how your hormone levels are doing and how you're feeling good. Because even though you still have your ovaries, that your uterus is still there's still an estrogen receptor, and you still could go into perimenopause. I you know I could go into perimenopause early and all and all that. But it, but if it was a man, there would be there's a whole follow up. If you if you look at the trail of care after a man has a vasectomy, there's much more follow-up. And that's like an in and out procedure instead of getting your whole inside taken out. A hysterectomy could have many, many underlying conditions. 
that also need to be monitored in tandem with that, but that a doctor might not follow up on that is insane to me and just says a lot about how women need to really be their own advocate and advocate for themselves even harder than a man would have to at the doctor. Correct. They have to be educated and aware and they're just, there has been lack of education in this menopause world. And I I personally lived through it. My mom thought she was going through menopause for years because of spotting, because spotting is like having your periods like back and forth for like years. She actually had, she had cervical cancer, but there's this lack of education. You just, it's not there. And it's the way our medical community is and it's just the way our system, but it, it is changing and it's changing because these options that are for women are outside of the healthcare system. They are, you have to pay for them, but they're affordable and they're not controlled by the insurance companies. So right. that's why we're really taking charge of it ourselves. When you want something done, women have to do it. We absolutely do. And I, this might be one of the biz- biggest examples of why we have to do that. Do you have any scripts or any advice for women who haven't found that professional yet? They haven't found a, pr- a good provider that's a good match and they need to just still deal with the doctor that they've been dealing with? So I would recommend if your doctor is not the doctor that specializes in hormones and menopause, Go, you could go onto the NAMS website. You could go on, you could search it on Google and find NAMS certified physicians that are specifically trained in like bioidenticals and hormone replacements. You could also do doing a search online. You go to Femgevity Health. You could, <laughs> you could, but I would specifically find a doctor that's specific, that is trained niche for menopause treatment. Okay. Yeah. Don't waste your breath trying to. And negotiate with these doctors. You just have to no, do- you just have to make sure that your doctor understands menopause and is correct and is certified. Yeah. Tell us the name of that organization that certifies doctors. The Nash the National National Association of Menopause Society. Okay. NAMS. Yep. They could go to that website and it has all the lists of the doctors that are certified and by state. And you know, we could always point people to doctors too. We have a live chat on our website as well. Okay, great. I will link to that and make sure that is an available, easily available resource for people to check their providers. Thank you so much for being here, Michelle. For your final words of wisdom, will you let us know what we should be looking out for when we should be reaching out for help? What are the symptoms that necessitate a visit to a provider that knows what they're doing? One of the first things I would recommend is when you're at your GYN appointment, and even if you're 35, get a baseline of your hormones now. Get a full workup of your progesterone, estrogen, estradiol, TSH, FH, LH, testosterone, cortisol, insulin. So you have a baseline of when you were really feeling your best pre before perimenopause. So you have something to compare when you are going through that stage. So you really know what's normal for you. Because a lot of times what happens is doctors that are not specialized in this field they do your bloods and you're feeling not great, but your bloods are within normal range. And they're like, oh, you're fine. But that just because they're a normal range, does that mean that that's your normal? Because it's a vast range. So if you could take charge now, do it. And I would recommend the moment that you have brain fog or you're not sleeping the same, or you know, you feel anxious or you're more fatigued, any type of symptoms that you don't feel right, don't sit on them. You know, I'm not saying menopause is is perimenopause, that's what it is, but in, in general, in life, do not sit on it, take charge, don't be fearful, and don't be afraid to talk to your friends, get referrals your doctors, whoever you feel comfortable with, you really have to pay attention to what doesn't feel right and know how you feel and start with getting tested to see what's going on first so you could have proper treatment for yourself to feel better. Yeah. Data really is power. Yeah. Data is powerful. Data is powerful. Yeah. The more the more data that we're getting now is in the future, we see like a predictive analytics for people, how they develop menopause and perimenopause, because everything's different. Like African-American women have much harsher symptoms than Asian women. 
And so we're going to be able to, as this data collects, we're going to be able to really see and guide women around it that way. A utopian future for all of us. <laughs> I see it. I see it. <laughs> yes. It is, it is out there. It is within our grasp. Well, thank you so much for being here. Please tell us where we can find you online. You could find us at longevityhealth.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And to come in the near future are some webinars and events. And stay tuned. We cannot wait. If you want to support The Spinster Life, listen up. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Or sign up for the Substack newsletter, spinsterlife.substack.com. Or follow us on Instagram at Living the Spinster Life. I'm also on YouTube. The channel handle is The Spinster Life. Thanks for listening. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank we'll you. see you next it's time. Wonderful being here. Thank, Thank you. you.